Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hey, this is Dyke Drummond at the home of The Happy MD in beautiful Seattle, Washington, with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. I'm back with a previous guest, Amandip Sidhu from doctors-in-distress.org.uk, who founded his charity in the wake of the tragedy of his older brother's suicide, older brother's a cardiologist, uh, to make a difference on the prevention side to hopefully help doctors before they're in crisis and has had a very successful run with the charity over the last three years. So you were founded in what, 2018? Late part of 2018, early in 2019, yeah. And we're now in, in 2021. And what I wanna do is, is have this episode dedicated to if you're somebody who wants to start a charity that would affect burnout and suicide in in healthcare as an example, or any kind of a public service charity like that, what are some lessons that have been learned in the course of doctors in distress that you might use to shorten your learning curve? So um, if you could, Amandip, if you could just share with us how you got started, how you decided where to focus, what do you feel are some of the success factors that you've learned along the way, and some of the, some of the times you crashed and burned and learned a lesson there too. Sure. Okay. First of all, thanks for having me back um, on another episode. Really enjoyed the last one. So uh, hopefully we'll get a, a productive uh, session here. So um, the, the, the reason I started the charity, I think, as I explained previously, but very briefly, was following the suicide of my older brother, um, Jagdeep Sidhu, in November 2018. Um, I, I decided very quickly that I wanted to do something that was meaningful, impactful, primarily to make sure that what happened didn't happen to others and so the first starting point that I had actually perversely was coming up with the name and I don't know why it happened but it was just one of those sort of creative moments and I think it was about 3 30 in the morning on a Monday I just randomly woke up and <laughs> thought I just thought right what, what am I going to call this and I, I just I just called it doctors in distress so so the first thing I actually did was um as you do is to buy the domain name um, and yes. I realized that <laughs> before you do anything, you know, don't even decide what it's going to do or how okay. it's going to work. Just go out and buy the website. So that's tip number one. The Absolutely. first thing you do when you have a name idea is go see if the URL is available. Absolutely. So, so that's the first <laughs> thing I did. And I literally did it there and then on my mobile phone. So uh, right. <laughs> I, I think looking back, it only cost me the equivalent of 10 bucks a year or something. So I knew I found something that nobody else wanted and I thought, okay, great. So that's a great investment to start off with. So uh, didn't need to make a huge upfront investment. And then over the sort of following weeks, I then, I tried to apply a lot of my skills that I've learned in my career. So I, just for those listening, in case you didn't listen to the last episode, I'm not a medic, I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm just a, a normal member of the public, but- um, With I've a worked pharmacy in a background. Indeed, indeed. It's still You're on paper. Doctor but... for an older brother. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, sort of a, a, a pseudo healthcare profession, as I call it. But that, that, that's definitely another episode. But um, I, I've spent the last 15, 16 years working in the pharmaceutical industry. So I've worked in many disciplines like commercial, business development, operations, quality. So again, being very pharmacist like, I've worn lots of different hats. And again, indeed, like doctors, juggled lots of balls at the same time. So I try to utilize a lot of those experiences. So my first starting point um, after buying the website was to realize or start to think rather, what, what is it that can be done to, to that would have primarily saved people like my brother? And so I think about some of the things that could have helped. And as we discussed in the last episode about, you know, bringing doctors together in safe spaces and raising awareness, deconstructing stigma. And then I started to sort of brainstorm and document all of this just really for my own benefit in a very corporate manner about um you know coming up with three things and I, I just wanted to formulate three things that i wanted to do and then work out later how to do it so the first one was around um deconstructing stigma around doctors mental health and 
the whole topic of physician health generally. Uh, secondly, was around coming up with um, ways to change cultures and behaviours. And thirdly, to promote the value of good, strong, compassionate leadership. And I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I came up with three things that were going to be paramount through everything that we did as a charity. So we were always mindful that whatever activity we would do, whatever task that we did, added value to one of those three objectives. So that would be my second tip is come up with three strong objectives that, that are going to be paramount to, to why your organization exists. And I would, I would say ideally things that are not an exact match for something that's already going on. Exactly. And, and that was my next point. So once you've done that, go and check next, I think, if somebody else is doing that. Now, if you, what I found were people that probably weren't doing that because we wanted to, I wanted to focus very much on prevention, but I would say in advice to people, if you find other people that are doing this in a similar space, unless you could do something different, that's not easy, easily replicable, I would just veer away from doing it because it dilutes the message, particularly in a nonprofit charity sector. It doesn't make sense to dilute the message and have an additional voice sometimes indirectly and without meaning collab um, competing because nobody wins you, you don't you don't um, achieve anything very very quickly so try and find that sort of what what's often said in the commercial world is gap in the market what what is somebody not doing and are you able to offer that and importantly then try to understand um is there a need for that amongst a pseudo customer base so one of the other things that i did i did my own market research as i called it so <clears throat> I, I sent a survey out to doctors to try and measure at that time, and this was April 2019, so pre-pandemic, how do doctors feel about burnout? How burnt out are you? How do you feel? And, um, you know, it wasn't very scientific, it was very subjective, but I got 720 responses. Um, and, and one of the things I did very quickly and was fortuitous in actually starting to partner and collaborate with people that had access to my end user, so medics, doctors. So there's a great organization that we still work with and partner with on many things called the Doctors Association UK, DA UK. Uh, and they, they actually published my first blog where I told my brother's story and said, I'm doing some research. I'd really um, appreciate your views because this will feed into a charity that will actually have impact and do things to help alleviate. So I got a absolute swathe of feedback uh, both in my 10 questions and lots of free text with lots of four letter words about how people were feeling. So it really brought to life, I guess, sort of a live measurement. And I know that's a very medical thing to do is because um, I know that's very much in training of presenting with a problem, investigate, measure and then treat. So I tried to follow a similar ethos. And so then, then it sort of, you know, fed into unvalidated my thoughts about what was needed and you know, it then provided me with some insights about how my objectives could be achieved based on the feedback that I got. And so then I started to formulate these. And But then I realized very quickly that, um, and all of this I was doing in a career break, by the way. So this was my, in quotes, day job, as it were, even though I got no monetary return out of it. And I wouldn't want any anyway. But I realized very quickly that in order to have any meaningful impact in, in what I wanted to do, I needed to bring in the right people. And again, I try to sort of take a lot of parallels. What I've learned from the business world is very often the entrepreneur, the founder of something may not always be the right person to help take that forward. So I then started to research who else is active in this space. Um, are they doing what I'm doing? And if not, let's collaborate and, and, and have a conversation. So um, I brought in, um, first of all, Dr. Uh, Dame, Professor Claire Gerarda. Um, she has a very long title because she's won so many accolades, but she's, a, a, I think, as we mentioned in the previous episode, a, a very well-known advocate of physician health. And I realized very quickly with the links that she had and the um, relationships that, he had, that she had both within the medical systems, the health systems, and particularly at government level, that could really, you know, start the charity off in a very, very good way. And then we really just applied good business principles. So, we tried to make, we brought in people that we knew um, would add value. And one of the first things, um, one of the first people that, that joined us, we, we put in place a, an executive function. Um, so we had a CEO. And just before this time, I set the charity up through our legal regulator. Um, and it was a complete unknown for me. I've never done anything like this before. So I learned along the way of what needs to be done. And every country I know has its own process. But um, 
Um, I would advise if you if you know someone who's been through that process to just tap into their knowledge and, and learn what you can. I unfortunately didn't have that. And I think probably just by a sheer fluke and by good luck, I managed to um, navigate the, re the legal and regulatory pathway for registering a charity very well off my own back. So I was quite lucky in that regard. I just applied good common, you know, um, principles of just common sense, what I thought was the right thing to do. And it turned out to be coherent with what uh, what our regula regulator wants here in, uh, in England. So, so I set up, a, a, I guess, a framework and, and a starting point. And then just bringing in the right people is really, really important. And it's important as well. And something that I found with a charity is if people believe in the mission and they understand what you're there to do and they understand the impact of what it does, they're very, very bought into the message and will do everything that they can to, to deliver that. And I think the fact that I started this charity based off a personal tragedy strikes a chord and a resonance with a lot of people. And, and as I do, you know, podcasts like these or other engagement events, you know, it, it just reminds me sort of how, how poignant and impactful what we do uh, is and how important it is to a lot of people. And, and that's delivered and shown through the hard work of the team. So, so towards the middle part of 2019, we started to sort of form and storm and did the usual corporate things. And we, uh, again, we decided not to be, we had two, cho I think charities really have two choices. One to be sort of a, uh, uh, you know, back of the house in the bedroom type of, you know, hobby or something. But we made a very conscious decision because of the nature of the topic and the importance of it, particularly. We wanted to be very grown up and have something that we knew was going to be successful and exist in many years to come. And so, you know, we brought in a team and, you know, put together the right funding strategy. And I would say, you know, tip number three, four, five, six, seven to infinity has to always revolve around sustainability. A charity cannot do anything without funding. And it's a very, very complex thing, which again, I don't have a lot of expertise or knowledge on, and I'm learning as we go. But again, bringing the right people that have years and decades of experience in this sector, you know, has, has really opened up mine and everyone's eyes about how we go about funding charitable ventures. So, you know, th th those are really, really important things. And I think, again, with Doctors in Distress, we've been a little bit fortuitous, again, probably through a very negative experience with the recent COVID pandemic, because that shone a real spotlight onto the whole topic and concept of physician health. Suddenly, there was interest in the wider public of this because crudely, you know, the public realized, well, OK, we're going to need someone to look after us here. So, you know, all of that, that sudden realization that something that's, you know, we're very lucky to have in the UK is a, is a free to access healthcare system. Suddenly, you know, there was a huge spotlight on the people within that delivering that. So we were, we were to a little part, you know, in the right place at the right time. Um, and so that's been quite fortuitous. So. You know, th there is a sometimes a little bit of luck involved, but, you know, ultimately something that I'm learning and starting to see from from the team and what we do through determination, hard work and belief in the vision and what you want to achieve, it will slowly start to realize it, realize itself into being something that's successful. And I always like to throw the statistic out there that, you know, since I started this charity two and a bit some years ago, I've actually had four doctors message me privately. Um, because we're a suicide prevention charity primarily and say because of what you do and because of the case of your brother etc um, I didn't end up taking my own life and that, that's really important to have that validation from the people that you're trying to help to say actually what you what you guys are doing meaningful because that 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 feedback like that keeps me going and, and that's been a huge validation to say tick yeah what, what I envisaged and what I set out to do um, is being achieved to some degree and it's helping one person so it, I guess if I could summarize that is, is number one, try and do something that's unique and that no one else is doing. Number two, make sure you have the right people around you and with the right expertise that you don't have critically and put your ego to one side and learn from those around you um, as, a, as a related point. And three, just continue to believe in what you're doing. And if it feels the right thing to do in your gut and your stomach, stick with it and it will it will come off eventually. And at this point in time, when you're talking about bringing the right people in, 
Uh, what is what is the payroll of your charity right now? How many F FTEs do you have on your staff at this point? So currently we have four FTEs um, and we've got a pool of about 10 to 12 volunteers that offer their time at no cost. Um, we also have a board of trustees of which I remain one. Um, so, you know, there is a bit of help there. So we're still in our infancy, as it were, compared to a lot of other charities and organizations. Um, but, you know, we are sustainable uh, and we do have, currently have a payroll and an FTE structure that, that we expect to grow certainly within the next few years. And uh, what I found, too, is when you're recruiting, <clears throat> when you're recruiting the right people into an organization that serves the health and well-being of physicians, it's interesting where those people come from. Um, so, for instance, <clears throat> I've seen people that have made great um, team players in my organization who had a sibling who had a heart defect when they were a child and they remember the doctors taking care of their sister and that inspires them to want to take care of doctors. So almost everybody has had an interaction with their own physical health or a family member's health or a friend's health or with a friend who is a doctor that can predispose them uh, to potentially come and work for an organization that would support physician wellness. And I think that it's really important when we listen to us talking about what may seem like dry business principles when we're talking about something that is preventative to physician suicide, it is a, it is a yes and conversation. It's not heart centered or bean counting. No, it's like you have to have a viable organization if you're going to have an impact. And um, in your case, you decided again, not back of the house, we're going for a freestanding um, uh, organization that is potentially going to live well beyond your time on this astral plane, right? Absolutely, yeah. And it's, um, you know, uh, again, a part of that, you know, th that journey so far is, you know, we do have FTEs, we have people, and, and I, I have to give a huge shout out to the team. They work incredibly hard and are dedicated, but it's immensely satisfying for me personally but also responsibility that people are paying their rent, their mortgages and relying on right. the organization to, to, you know, to, to sustain their own life. So, you know, that, that's quite a responsibility in itself, but immensely pleasing that as well as helping our end users and doctors, you know, we're also helping each other by, you know, having a sustainable organization that we can, we can, earn a, a, or the team earn a living off. I, I, I'm a trustee and I, I, don't ever want to you know benefit from the charity beyond seeing it make a meaningful impact but to know that other people are relying on it for their living is is gives me an equal measure of satisfaction and uh, and happiness from that if i'm honest well and if i can for those of you who are watching video i'm just going to screen share here and uh show you the team <laughs> because this was the post right here that uh, had me connect with you on linkedin and right out front is Dame Claire Garada, MD, uh, and the rest of the team. So there we go. There's your team. Wow. Yes, indeed. It's, uh, and, and I'm I'm so 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 proud of them. And and just for info, th this photo was taken um, at a uh, a stately home here in England. So this I was see that. this was the this is the living residence of the Earl of Shaftesbury. Um, and uh, I won't go into his sort of you know his story as well, but he. He came to learn of what we're doing through a, um, another organization called the Fathom Trust, which is actually led by a psychiatrist and works in a similar space that we do, but broadens that out to, to much more than doctors. It's, it's just for, for wider users. And so we, he invited us actually um, with his wife, the Countess of Shaftesbury, to, to his stately home for the weekend and a retreat. So we, nice. we, actually pra we, we practice what we preach. We had a, a weekend away of re you know, reflection, rest, recuperation, we didn't do the usual, you know, strategy for me. We just had an hour discussion, but we spent the time doing various activities as a group, as, as you know, we've talked about in, in another podcast and just spending that time together and, and really came together as a team. And, you know, when I look at this photo, it still gives me goosebumps because, you know, when I first came up with the vision, it was just me on the left hand side and, you know, still at a considerable weight um which i which i look at with uh, with great admiration for myself but uh you know joking aside you know to, to see sort of a team of people 
with a logo that I designed and, and just getting behind the mission has just been, you know, the most rewarding experience of my life, life so far and, and probably won't be surpassed going forward. So anybody really wanting to start something charitable and create an organization, um, just do it, you know, just, just go for it. And, you know, if it works, if it works, great. If it doesn't, well, at least you had a go, you, you know, but just do what your gut tells you is right. And, you know, but do it for the right reasons. Yep. And for those of you who are on the podcast, what we've got is a stately English manor in the background. And uh, Amon Dip is on the left hand side in a sweatshirt, but there's 13 other people with t shirts on with the logo of the organization spread out here, all with big smiles on their face. It's just lovely. So, real quick, got to do this before we go. Tell us one thing you learned the hard way. One thing I've learned the hard way is patience. So, I have a, and this is probably one of my personality traits that resonates with a lot of medics particularly, is, is I can be sometimes quite impatient, but something that I've learned with charities and this type of sector, everything takes time. Um, and I have to be tempered by my team to say, look, you know, I know you want X, Y, Z, but, you know, it's it's slowly chipping away at, at, at a huge thing. And I'll use the, the typical metaphor of, trying to move an oil tanker in a different direction it takes small meaningful steps um so anyone in this space you know please take on board that it things don't happen overnight um it can take weeks months years in fact but um you know the, the journey itself is is equally more enjoyable so just remember that it's it's also about having a journey as well but i i've certainly learned the hard way that um you know sometimes being impatient doesn't uh, doesn't always work so what did we go through here? We, we picked a good name. We found a niche where somebody's not doing something that we do, right? You built mm -hmm. a team and are built to last, right? Based on fiscal responsibility and you exercise a little bit of patience and go with your gut, right? Indeed. And, and, and if I can add just one last thing, um, when you bring in the right team, get out of their way and let them do the job. That's a really, really important thing. And, and again, we try and practice what we preach about good leadership. I haven't had sometimes in my career <clears throat> is if you bring in the right people and, you know, there's a famous quote on LinkedIn is you hire smart people to tell you what to do. You listen to them and you get out of the way, but give them the tools they need to do the job. Everything should flow from that. And, and what I'll do is just kick in a pitch for being fractal here, right? So you're taking care of doctors, make sure you take care of your people too, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Check in we with practice, early and we, often. Yeah, we practice what we preach. Right on, right on. Any other last tips for anybody who wants to start a charitable organization to support anything in healthcare? Um, nothing more than what I've said, but just to reiterate, you know, just believe it, do it for the right reasons. Um, do it and stick with it. And the reward that you get from helping other people um, is, is, immeasurable and you know it's really something that's enriched my life and changed me as a person and i would recommend that to others now this is not for beginners because they're three years in on their journey but give us just the thumbnail overview of the zermatt de verbier ski race fundraiser that you've got coming on in 2022 <laughs> um, indeed well i think you've probably caught me out dyke but um i i the, the team came up with that one but um <laughs> i love it I, I just, um, again, goes back to what I said, I just get out of the way and let the team do it. But um, it's a really exciting fundraiser that I think is scheduled for next year. It's a, um, it's a special ski um, journey, as it were. And, um, you know, please have a look at the website and our socials for more info. But, um, you know, you need to speak to the team on that one. I, I, that's I about it. my knowledge on it. But I'm, I'm going to be it. honest with you, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. They even got pictures of the guy who's going to be your guide talking in a very thick accent about how he's going to take you through the Alps. It sounds awesome. Okay, cool. So there we go. That's our second round with Amandip Sidhu from doctors-in-distress.org.uk, a charity founded in memory of his brother, a cardiologist who passed away from suicide in 2018. It's just been a pleasure being with you here through these two episodes. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I'm sure your brother is proud. And uh, for everybody who's listening, I'll see you in the next podcast. Until then, you just keep breathing and have a great rest of your day.